<laughs> well, he's a great fieldsman, Philip Tuffner. He often falls over and he's brought it into his batting as well. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vaughnian and Tuffers Cricket Club podcast brought to you by The Telegraph. Ben, Michael and Phil back with you, reflecting on yet another amazing test in the ashes. There's lots to talk about, but the bald fact is that England are now 2-0 down to Australia. There have been 72 Ashes contests in the past 141 years, and only once in that time has a team come back from going 2-0 down to win the series. Mike, Phil and I will get into why England, despite a heroic effort, ultimately fell short, some of the controversy in the match, and we'll discuss what they need to do to turn things around. We'll also get the reaction from Down Under from former Aussie bowler Brad Hogg, who has expressed some forthright views in the press over the past couple of days. And ahead of the third test at Headingley next week, we'll check in with our cricket correspondent Nick Holt for all the latest from the England camp. Right, morning Mike, morning Phil. Uh, Where to start? Lots to discuss. Uh, Hell of a test match. Uh, I guess the first thing to ask was, were you entertained? And the second thing to ask is, if so, does that make up for the fact that England lost, Mike? (laughs) Uh, No, uh, it's about winning. Uh, England are 2-0 down. It was a great test match once again. I mean, it just had um, so much skill, uh, some great cricket. Uh, England were at the races on day one when the clouds were around and the lights were on. They didn't uh, switch on quick enough. Uh, I thought they really fought back really well on the second day and then there was that kamikaze batting display when the bouncer trap was set with Nathan Lyon off the pitch. England 188 for one. And for me, that's where the game was lost from England's perspective. They should have got very close to uh, Australia, if not a lead in the first innings. It had made Australia's uh, second innings, the third innings of the match, that little bit trickier. And they wouldn't have been chasing 371. They might have been chasing 270. Uh, and I think they'd have uh, been hot favourites to chase that. And I think they would, uh, I, don't, I don't think it'd have been comfortable because it's in Ashes and it's England. But uh, I do think they'd have won the game and they'd have batted better um, and, and also bowled better in the first innings. But the drama of the, the Mitchell Stark catch on the fourth evening, that, that created a huge amount of debate. And then obviously the last day was just kamikaze chaos. I've never seen Lord like it. Your, your, your ground, Phil. Oh, it, 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 it turns into Galatasaray away. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to hell. I, I, I've never seen Lords like it. I mean, the World Cup final was similar to sort of like um, yeah, passion vibrancy. And, yeah. vibrancy and everything. But no, it really was like a, a gladiatorial arena. It was something special. But I, I just want to ask, though, I was entertained on that last day, but I must admit I wasn't entertained with the continual short ball bowling. I really no, true. wasn't. I mean, it it became very repetitious, very dull. People just losing it. I think they've got to look into that. Otherwise, we're just going to get a diet of every, you know everyone on the leg side and keep shoving it up you. Um, so I think they need it, to look at that. It was an interesting one, wasn't it? Because I think um, Stokes Stokes mentioned that he thought it was the ball, and they were going soft quickly. And obviously, there were an issue with the ball last season, um, yeah. and everybody thought that there was potentially a bad batch. But, but clearly that might be something that's happening. If the ball is going soft and you're not getting it moving through the air or off the ground, then what's the alternative? I mean, it, it, did, it did turn into a body line at one stage, you know, just with everyone, you know, on the... I've never seen fields... I've never seen fields like it. You know, yeah. on, that, on that last day, everyone on the boundary, on the, you know, days two and three when they were doing the short ball kind of ploy as well... Um, it was just one of those test matches that you can't take your eyes off again. But that little period when they just kept bowling it short, I think it was for about, I don't know, a session, session and a half. I must admit, I was on the uh, the highlights show and I don't think I spoke. I don't think I got in the show, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, I do think, I mean, if you look at the Aussies in the second innings bowling to England, they tried the short stuff and didn't get it right. No, you know, no. So England actually delivered the skill of the short stuff incredibly well. You know, Ollie Robinson... After lunch on day four, I think he rolled nine overs, two for seven. Yeah. You know, it's 79, 80 miles an hour. And the Aussies didn't play it well at all. So England will certainly uh, go for that tact. It was sensational stuff. That last day was just, I was, I was, I couldn't sit still. It was just, it was just a great uh, spectacle. Yeah. And, and, and even with the crowd sort of, you know, 
baying for blood and, you know, and, and sort of getting right behind Ben Stokes. When Ben Stokes started ten off, he's some cricketer, that bloke, you know. He yeah. is some player, mate. I tell you, I've played with a lot of great players, but when that bloke flicks the switch, I don't think there's anyone better in the world. That's the thing, the ability to go through the gears. Because, again, it was another one of those innings where he built it up slowly and then... Then he went ballistic. Oh. And, I mean, where does it rank for you, Mike? I mean, it's probably not quite up there with Headingley because it just didn't quite get the job done, right? No, but I, I, I think it was an equally extraordinary innings, even though he didn't get the win. I mean, to to, to basically single-handedly oh. uh, chase down the last 200 runs on his own with a little <laughs> bit of courage and help, great help from Stuart Broad. Um, yeah, he's remarkable. I mean, I just think the Johnny Bairstow incident... Um, triggered him into that yeah. you know we just don't know whether we would have said this way you know the johnny stuff is 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 still big news both prime ministers are involved uh, oh. everyone seems to be having an opinion um we're suddenly the the, <clears throat> the the nicest cricket team in the world that we would never have done it in our time oh god we, we would never break the spirit of the game never. and obviously the, the australian let's let's, get, let's come back to the bearstow incident in a minute oh. and the spirit of the game but 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 on um, on Ben first, just just finish off your th- your thoughts on the on the innings. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if we would have seen that not without that incident. Yeah, you right. just don't know. So actually, the incident created a, a special moment for us all. And uh, England will say that if Johnny had stayed out there, they'd have won the game. Uh, who knows? We just don't know in, in in sport. But one thing's for sure: Ben's clarity under pressure is just extraordinary. Yeah. And he just picked his end. It was like a T twenty innings. He was picking his end, batting from the pavilion end. Um, targeting that, that 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 shorter side down the slope with the wind. I thought the Aussies got it wrong for a long time because they were bowling into his arc almost then yeah. like almost like yeah. under twelve cricket, oh he'll miss one eventually. I guess he did and Steve Smith dropped it, but it's a dangerous ploy to someone like Ben Stokes who's done it before yeah. on a few occasions. Um once Hazelwood came to the pavilion end, I always and I was on car said this could be an issue. Because he's going to be hitting up the slope into a slight bridge. It's a big hit into that far corner, Phil, isn't it? Yeah. It's a big, big hit, and he tried to take it on. If, if he gets it, obviously it goes for six, but he just lost his shape, bit of bounce, and um, if, we knew if, straight away, as soon as Kerry took that catch, it was game over. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 if, if all the people, if all the fielders hadn't been on the boundary, he would have scored about 350. He was absolutely crunching them to on the fellows who were on the boundary, and he, he had to deal virtually in sixes because you just couldn't, penetrate the field because everyone was just back on the boundary uh they ran the occasional two and i just want to reiterate mike's point as well i want a, a, a big big shout out to Stuart broad he got absolutely peppered he yeah. did he'll be coming off it, it'll look like a leopard in that shower i tell you <laughs> it'll be completely covered in little badges and little medals all over him he took it for about an hour and a half and i've been in that situation and it's not much fun and i, th- I think that he played his part wonderfully as well it was i've never i've never been as enthralled on a fifth day on a Lord's Test match in my life, it was something to behold. I'm, I'm, I'm always, I'm almost glad I was there. It's one of those, one of those days when you said I was glad I was there and witnessed. And, and, and I do, I do think. Um, I know we're going to speak about the issue and the Ben uh, and obviously Johnny Bairstow situation out in the middle. But without what we saw, I don't think the third Test would have had anywhere near the hype that we now have. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So everyone will write. I mean, Henley, if you ever wanted to choose a venue oh. to carry on with the raucous last day of Lord's crowd, uh, England are going to the right place. It'll be yeah. absolutely pumping. They'll be booing everything Australia do. Yeah. Um, they'll be singing all the songs throughout the whole of the game and England will get... And, and then this England team are tuned. Let's forget, the 2 nil down in the series. Yeah, I don't think I've ever known an England side have so much support. And the 2 nil down. No. Usually when you're 2 nil down against the Aussies, you're getting absolute pelters. Everyone's getting sat. There's a review just about to happen in the game of cricket <laughs> once again. I've never known anything like it where, you know, this team are very, very popular. They've almost got a cult following the way that they've played over the last year. And it's a difference. There's obviously the cricket fans that have, have enjoyed the cricket, but there's a number of new fans that are suddenly getting into cricket because of the way that they're playing and their cult followers, they'll have no criticism of the basball. Basball yeah. is perfect, it's brilliant, doesn't matter that they're 2-0 down. And I'm like in the school of thought, but wait a minute, it's about winning the Ashes, isn't it? <laughs> I want to win. 
you know, I want to want to get that earning. At the minute, England have got a long way to uh, go. Well, it's it's almost a miracle from here for them to get the Ashes in their in their hand in a few weeks' time. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, let's let's deal with those two um, incidents, the two bits of controversy. First of all, the Mitchell Stark catch. I think we could deal with that pretty quickly. It wasn't a catch, right? No, I mean, I, I, I thought at the time I was unconscious. Oh, he's got it under control. Um, I, I'll openly admit that I didn't quite understand the rules of the game uh, <laughs> about the motion of the body. As soon as I read that, you know, you knew it was not out because he scraped the ball uh, across the turf. I mean, I think if Mitchell had that catch again, he'd just turn his hand the other way and and, yeah. s- and scrape it along the floor. And if it bounces out, it's not, but it stays in his hand. It's obviously uh, out. So um, Mitchell was a bit too cool for school with his celebration. Um, and the right decision was made on that fourth evening. So the second and much bigger piece of controversy was uh, Johnny Bairstow being stumped. We initially thought run out, but obviously he was stumped uh, by Carey. Um, Phil and Mike, I think you've got different views of this. So, Phil, do you want to go first? I will go first. I will go first. I haven't got different views. It's out. It's as simple as that. It is out. Uh, it's in the rules of the game, and so that's fair enough. The only slight issue I have with it is about this spirit of the game, and also that it was the last ball of the over. It was yeah. the last ball of the over to which then, when does the umpire, listen, I've played quite a bit of cricket in my time, and sometimes the umpires, do, umpires just start walking off. You know, you bowl, you bowl the last ball, the umpire then starts heading off to square leg, and then after about four or five paces, then calls over, you know, or sometimes doesn't even call over. You know, I've I've been out there when they don't call over. It's not, it's not you know, a religious sort of thing that they do. And so... He left the ball, he taps down with his back foot three or four times, he's well in his crease, and then it's the end of the over, he knows it's the end of the over, and he walks up to have a chat to his mate. Yeah. Now, if you have to wait every single time for the umpire to call over, we're already having trouble with, with over rates and what have you, we'll be out there all day. You know what I mean? Um, so, listen, it's out. <laughs> Phil, I'm looking at who breaks the spirit of the, the, spirit of the game first? Who breaks the spirit of the game first? Yeah, if we're we're on to this nonsense about the spirit of the game, which is absolute garbage, because the spirit of the game gets broken every single day by every team in the world. There's things that happen within the game of cricket that are against the spirit of the game, so it's utter nonsense. So Johnny Bairstow not looking round to the keeper on three consecutive balls just to give the indication, yes, am I allowed to leave my crease? Is that breaking the spirit of the game before the Australians don't bring him back? Why is Johnny Bairstow breaking the spirit of the game there? Well, it's the etiquette of the game that you, the game, the ball is still live in the keeper's gloves. Yeah, it's still but, alive. That's why it's out. It, the ball is still. Yeah, alive. I understand it. So out. the week before, the week before, I've just listened to Travis Head. Travis Head has told the story that the week before at Edgebass, and he's batting the last ball of the over. The ball is whipped in. He's out of his crease. He then whips his bat back into his crease. Johnny's got the ball in his hand, and he turns to Johnny and he said. Johnny, were you going to whip the bales off? And Johnny turns to Trump and says, absolutely. Right, well, yeah. <laughs> and in the, well. fir- in the first innings at Lord's, Jimmy Anderson, why have off stumped to Johnny Bairstow, keeping Marnus Labashane's bang. Guess what he does? He saw Marnus walking out machine. Guess what he does? Yeah, but that's He's not Marnus. Wa- so that's a different incident. Because Marnus, why? Was, because he was taking guard outside of the crease. He was therefore trying to get closer to the pitch of the ball. He was trying Johnny to make Bairst- sure... That- jo- Johnny Bairstow was batting out of his crease. No, no, he wasn't. He wasn't. He was in his crease and he well, tapped back before he walked out because he thought it was the end of the over. Marnus was batting outside of his crease and therefore trying to gain advantage. There's no way Johnny was trying to gain an advantage. No, he wasn't. That's, that's correct. He wasn't gaining an advantage, but it's, it, it is absolutely a tactical manoeuvre that I, I I personally, I mean, I, I think all this high horse and... Uh, other okay. than now images that we're trying to create the England cricket team to be in. In the heat of the moment, I would say that every single England team that I played in would have done exactly the same as Pat Cummins. So I, so I agree with that. I think there is a degree of hypocrisy around. But I, I just don't think that Johnny Bairstow is trying to gain an advantage. And, and my, I've had some discussions with people with, about this. And the way I, I think about it is, would so I'll ask you a question, Mike. Would you give a warning before affecting a man-cad run out? There you go. 
Uh, I don't think so in this era now. No, you wouldn't. Okay. It's well, not not not, not uh, look four three years ago for you absolutely. But the game now knows, and we know in the game of cricket at the non-strikers end that if you leave your cricket, it's a rule. Yeah, you know, it is. have done it regularly. So now, no, but a few years ago, absolutely. Yeah. So the Australian team has a, a standing rule that it won't affect a man cad without giving a warning. And and Stark has done that in past, give one or two warnings. I think if you're giving a warning for a man cad, you should give a warning in this instance because Johnny Bairstow is not trying to gain an advantage. And actually in a man cad, the uh, non-striking batsman, is trying to gain an advantage. He's trying to get a little bit further down the wicket in case there's a run, right? So, you're so if you're going to give a warning that, in that just, just, to, just to clarify, so you think that Australia should have called him back? I do, yeah. I, th- I, th- I think they should have given him a warning. If they see he's coming out of the crease, but he's not getting an advantage, then, then, then the right thing to do, as far as I'm concerned, is give a warning and then get him so out. Can I ask part. you another question? So you don't think, so you're not just saying, actually, so skill. So mm-hmm. Johnny Bairstow is dozy. Yes, I three, agree with that. Three, three consecutive balls, he doesn't look back to Alex Carey. Yeah. That, for me, is breaking the spirit of the game. Well, I mean, Why? Why? If, 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 if being because dozy breaks the spirit of the game, then half, 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 half the people are going to He's, he could have so he could have been run out three consecutive balls. Yeah, but he t- he's he, he put his foot back two times, tapped it back into his crease to say, right, I'm back. It, I'm in the crease. He was in his <laughs> crease by he was virtually batting in the crease anyway. But you've yeah. still got Phil. I batted for years, and you still look round to the keeper. Wow! Well, and that's give it the exactly. thumbs up. You do. That's just the etiquette of the game. You do it. It's yeah. not. It's not I just think- me getting on a on a high. I'm just saying the etiquette of the game has always been when you're batting, even when you tap back in. You just look round to the keeper just to give it a nod and then you leave your crease. It's absolutely you, fine in that situation. If I'm bowling at Edinley, I am I'm do, I'm I am going to uh, I am going to be trying to mancad every <laughs> single one. I am now going to be taking it right to the wall. So no you're not. It's that, that's all <laughs> that's all going too far. That that's not going to happen. And and mancads and now and and if if players want to leave their crease at the non-strikers and before the ball's bowled, they are absolutely stupid in this era because we all know the consequences. It wouldn't have happened in our time and there would have been lots of warnings and maybe Australia will still warn about the man cad. That's what they said their, their kind of team rule is. But, you know, I don't think... I'm reading lots of stuff saying, oh, Henley's going to be like a war bath. You know, there's going to be all sorts. No, it won't. It'll be hard cricket. And guess what? As soon as it happened, England looked a better cricket team. I mean, it set the game on fire, that's for sure. Yeah. You know, even the coaches said England looked galvanised by the situation. So everything that we said at Edge Baston and for the first few days, where England just looked very, very friendly. I think England are a better cricket team when they've yes. got this little bit of this little Agreed. spice in them. In a funny sort of way, Mike. In a funny sort of way, Lords for those first three or four days didn't do them any favours because it's sort of lovely. There's that yeah. Lords hum. And this yeah. England cricket team need a little bit of spite. They need a little bit of spark. Uh, and I think Headley could give it to him. As you might expect, there has been some punchy reaction to all the drama at Lords in Australia. So we thought it would be a good idea to talk to someone down there who can tell us what the mood's like. And I'm delighted to say we're joined by former Aussie bowler Brad Hogg. Hi, Brad. Thanks for joining us. Firstly, uh, are you enjoying the series? And, and what's been the general reaction to the first two tests? We're all loving the series, uh, really enjoying the way that England are playing. Uh, this this new baseball approach, more aggressive uh, approach, it, it's just been scintillating cricket. And it, it, even I put my hand up, the, the um, first innings of the second test match when Australia went with the short pitch bowling, I thought, and Nathan Lyon had injured himself, I thought, right, I've got to put it in the cupboard here and try and wear that pace attack down. But then... Going back, when you're in that aggressive mode and that mindset, if the ball's there to hit, you see it, you hit it. Um, if you're in two minds, then you get yourself in trouble. And I think that happened with Joe Root in the second innings there where he got hit in the forearm in the, fir- uh, the ball before he got out. So you've got to be careful with it. But England are taking the test, uh, test arena forward. It's more exciting. And I think we're going to get more fans to uh, the longer version of the game. So well done, England, on that. And what's been the general reaction in Australia? Are they uh, is everybody because everybody here is loving it? They're on the edge of their seats. Uh, is that the case in Australia as well? 
Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, England declaring on day one of the uh, series, that was just scintillating stuff. And we're all talking about Pat Cummins, the third best bowler in the world, coming into one of the lower-ranked batsmen in the world, Crawley, for the first ball, and he's got a deep point. We had three deep fielders in the first 10 overs of a test match um, and a, of an Ashes series. And we've got the best bowling attack going around. Uh, I don't care whether the wicket's flat or not. If you've got the new ball in hand, you're you're aggressive against two uh, batters, but Duckett, who's uh, just new to the scene, and Crawley, who's uh, struggling struggling to keep his spot. Uh, I just thought we were a little defensive there, and England uh, didn't take the initiative. Yeah. So I mean, how is that sort of playing to uh, the Australian mentality? Because it's you're probably used to having grown up and through your playing career for the Australians to be the alpha dogs. I mean, here uh, it is, as you say, England being a bit more aggressive. Is that sort of, uh, is there sort of almost a bit of a cultural debate going on in Australia? Oh, a little bit of a cultural debate, but at the, at the end of the day, we're sitting back here uh, in Australia and we, we're sitting, we've won two test matches, but yeah. England should have won both of those test matches. The yeah. first test match, it was Bairstow missing the stumping of Green straight after uh, the dismissal of Head, and then he dropped a, a relatively simple chance a bit later on just before the new ball came and then broad bowled that no, no ball to Kawaja. Those three dismissals, especially the Green one, cost you the test match. Yeah. Now we go to test two. If you look at the no balls and the buys that have uh, occurred, if it wasn't for them, you would have been over the line as well. So this series is closer than what everyone thinks. The only the only worry I have on an entertainment perspective is Ben Stokes' yeah. fitness. He's yeah. got to be fit for England, and he's got to be fit for the entertainment value of the game. Because if he's not, um, the, the the game's worse off. Yes, I yeah. want Australia to win, but at the end of the day, entertainment comes first. And um, yeah. yeah, that's where I'm at now. So, so the Lords Test, there were several controversial points, and. Um, I know you have, we've been discussing it, Mike, Phil and I have been discussing some of them and I know you have a different viewpoint, but I'm also keen to get the uh, the views from Australia, what people there are talking about. So I think three really, there's the Steve Smith catch, there's the Mitchell Stark catch and then there's the Kerry stumping of Bearstow. So what were your views on those three incidents? Uh, right, um, Mitchell Stark catch. Definitely out. He had control of the ball before he's uh, touched the ground. And if you had a back back view of it, um, I, I would have thought that there was part of a few fingers underneath the ball there. So for me, that was in control. He had total control of the ball. Whereas Steve Smith didn't have control of the ball. Uh, you see the two fingers under the ball when he's and when it's touched the grass. You can see the ball touching the grass there. If he had a better grip on it and controlled it all the way to his chest, definitely out. But because it bubbled to uh, on his chest, not out. When we go to the Bearstow incident, um, as, a, as a player, and I heard Vaughn saying that, yeah, I'd probably, in the heat of the moment, thinking, right, that's out. But now I'm on the board of the Wacker here and uh, I'm in an administrative role. I look at it differently. I'm looking at the, uh, the, the um, entertainment value. But I'm also... Uh, I'm, I'm looking at it in a fresher uh, mentality. I'm, I'm not involved in the game. I'm just looking at it from afar. And I looked at it and I thought, this is not right. It's not right. Um, Bearstow has been um, doing it for the whole winnings. Uh, I think he was doing it for the test, test match before as well. So it had become the norm. The keeper's taken the glove. He's passed it off to the fielder. They planned it three balls before that happened. He did it twice before um, they did it on the on the final ball of the over. For me, I think it took uh, they took it too far. Um, if it happened the first time that Bearstow walked out of the crease in the Test series, fair enough, but not when he's done it a hundred times because it's become normalised. Um, and you go, you go through it as well. I, I heard McDonald say, "Oh, it's just the same as throwing a ball down the leg side. To if Tuffers is bowling or I'm tough, uh, bowling with someone charging into the crease, no, it's not. The batsman <laughs> is not in control of his body. Bairstow's in control of his body. Yes, he didn't look behind, but as I said before, it's become the norm. He scratched it. He's on balance <laughs> and he's just going down. He's not taking advantage. But then you've got to take. Then you've got to look at the umpiring, and I think this is the biggest discussion that we've got to have because the catches." Diabolical because they're not they're not interpreting uh, uh, interpreting it differently, and then you look at the two on field umpires in this particular Bearstow incident. Both of them aren't watching 
the actual incident where the stump has been uh, knocked or the bars have been taken off. The uh, umpire at the bowling end is taking the cap off the bu- 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 uh, buckle. Yeah. Gaffney, out point, is walking in with his head down. But they both looked at each other and virtually said, that's over. Um, but none of them have looked at the actual incident. Then they've gone up to the third umpire. It's not the third umpire yeah. to decide whether it was called over or not. It's the two officiating umpires out in the middle. Yeah. And if they thought that it was the end of the over, it's the end of the over. Yeah. Um, you don't have to say it. As Tuffer said earlier on right. on the podcast. Well, Brad, can, can I can I can I ask you a question? Do you really think in that split second? So I reckon there's about three seconds. Right from the ball going to carry, he do, he takes the ball so quickly and he throws it. It's probably three seconds. Do you really think the umpires are going to call over after three seconds of the ball going past I, the batter? I don't. Yeah, I, do, I don't think they would. I, I, I would. I wouldn't expect an umpire to do that. But it's just the reaction that the umpires had. Bairstow's ducked. He's uh, he's in the crease. And we've we've talked about the Labuschagne uh, incident. Labuschagne's out of the crease. That's fair game. You're you're going after you're you're, you're going for the stumping there. Bairstow was batting in his crease. Didn't move out of his crease. Didn't lose balance. He's done it before, uh, and the Australians have normalised it by not going for that type of dismissal earlier on. If they, if it's it's a bit like a man cat. Um, we've seen these man cats happen at the end of a game when the game's on a knife's edge. We don't see it happening from the first ball, and that's where the when you talk about the spirit of cricket. That's where the spirit of cricket comes on. It's where the actual incident, which is a controversial, yeah. actually happens. Um, and that's that's where I sit on it. It's the normal. I'm not calling out the Australians cheats because the law no, says. Nobody would. Just, just yeah. So I'm going to ask you both, Phil and, and Brad. So you're out in the, in the middle there. You're, Brad, you're, you're feeling for Australia. In the, no, in the heat of battle. And Phil, you're feeling, feeling no. for England. And by the way, it's the second test in Australia. You won the look. So the second test, Adelaide. And that happens to your team at that moment. What are you doing as a player? If I, if I was playing for Australia and it happened to us, I'd yeah. be up in arms. No, 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 no. You've misread that. The question is, you're out there in the middle with the Aussies, so you're a player. Yep. And Phil, you're a player for England. Exactly the same situation with the reverse scenario. An Australian batter's batting and we bowl a bouncer and we run him out. Or stumping. What are you both doing as players in the heat of the battle? They're, you're both in the fielding side, right? Yeah, Is both in the fielding asking? side. So you're, yeah. I'm creating the same scenario that Pat Cummins had for, for both of you. What are you doing as players? Well, in in the heat of the battle, I can understand it. I can understand it. And we're in the privileged position that we can all, as Brad was saying, we can sit back and look at it now, you know, a couple of days later and what have you. I just think in that situation, when, when all the boys are around, you're all patting each other on the back and you're going, yeah, come on, yeah, lovely, lovely, lovely. I think then that... Uh, perhaps the skipper has got to try, and you're a skipper, Mike, and I know it's difficult when you're in the heat of battle. I think he's just got to then try and step away from that situation very, very sort of quickly, which is very, very difficult to do, I know, because of the emotion and what have you, and then just think to himself and give him, or the umpires should then give him the opportunity to have a little bit of clarity of thought. The umpires should then come up to him um, and, and as you say, it's not a third umpire's decision or anything like that. The umpire should come up to him and pull him aside for a second and say, right, you have got the opportunity now to have a quick think about this and do you want to carry on with this or do you want to call him back? That's what they didn't do and that's what they should have done. They should have then helped him out a little bit there, yeah. just to give him a little minute to, to calm down and say whether he wants carry on with that if he then wants to carry on with it it's in the rules and he can say no i want him to, i want to carry on and i want him out and that's absolutely fair enough you haven't answered, the, the you haven't answered my question was, <laughs> what would you do as a player in that situation you've just passed it on to the captain I'm asking you as players what would you do well, that's why mike that's why that's why you get the big bucks mate as captain that's why you get <laughs> room and everything because you're the captain there's not one England player there may be one or two and I'm, I'm being uh, I can't really think of the top of my head who who would not have just gone it's out we're getting we're getting that wicket I'm sorry we're in an Ashes series the Ashes is hot we're 1-0 up we're going to go 2-0 up I'm sorry you're out Johnny you've been very dozy I, 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 
I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. But uh, I, I just think sometimes, you know, you, you've got to read a situation. But it was, was um, um, Butler, Josh Butler did it, didn't he? Josh Butler had the opportunity to do it when he was over there. And he said no uh, when, in the one day series, wasn't it? Yeah, something? it was. And he had, yeah, and it, was, it, yeah. was, it was an obstruction call, wasn't it? And he could have, he could have he, appealed for it. And by the laws of the game, it would have been out. But he decided not to. And very brilliantly, yeah. he said, we're over here for a long time. <laughs> Do do you yeah. also, Phil? I'll ask you again another question. I'm going to ask you lots of questions. If this was the uh, if this was on the other foot, and England had produced uh, produced that bit of uh, I'll call it a piece of skill because the keeper takes it in the the stump. It's still a piece of skill to get the the ball back onto the stumps by the keeper. Do you think? Do you think we would be absolutely lambasting the team, or would do you think we'd go? Well, it was a great piece of cricket thinking. Yeah, I'm, I'm not lambasting Australia at all here, Mike. I'm not having a go at them at all. I'm not having a go at them. I just think, if anything, I'm having a go at the umpire. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. And Brad brought it up. The the role of the umpire here, and you 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 made the point that the umpire was it wasn't at square leg; it was at point. But he's not looking at the crease, right? He's moving because he thinks it's over, and he should be yeah. saying to coming. I actually didn't see that because I was on the move because I well, they thought did, it was over. But they did check. But Ben, they checked. They checked it with the third. That's why we had a delay. What, what, what were they checking with the third umpire? They, make, well, they could clearly have been checking that he was out, and clearly he was out. The only people who know whether the umpires think it was over are the on-field umpires. They don't need yeah. to check. They don't need to check with the third umpire. Did I think it was? Over? But the ball, Ben. The ball is still live. The ball was in the keeper's glove for a millisecond. He he, he releases the ball. The ball's still live. It is. It is. I do agree. But the umpires have to decide when the over is has 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 finished. But the right? ball was obviously still live. Yeah, but they had clearly decided the over was over because they no, were on they the move. They weren't looking at the play. Ben. I'll, I'll, bring, I'll bring another thing up. I'll bring, I'll bring Jesus. another thing up. Like if I, if I was playing and I was with Ricky Ponting, Adam Gilchrist and uh, Matthew Hayden, there's no – I'd and even if I was playing now, I'd be taking the wicket. There's no doubt about that. But sitting from afar, the umpires have got to take control. Now, when a fast yeah. bowler comes in or a spinner comes in, they go, oh, you're close to the line there, mate. Just you're, you're pushing the line. Yeah. Now, if they're observing the game and they're seeing Johnny Bairstow do what he's doing, uh, you know, they, they should be able to go up to the batsman and say, look, Johnny, um, just a little bit more respect for the game because the ball's past you and you're walking out of your crease a little bit too early before we call dead ball or before it, uh, we see it actually um, deemed as dead ball. So you're putting yourself in a situation here which uh, could cause a bit of an issue down the track. I think... You know, this is a wake up for the umpires, especially with the, catch, the catchers. And, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm and stepping in here. I'm stepping on. in here, right? I'm not having. <laughs> I'm not having <laughs> the umpires at fault for. I'm sorry. It's the players. It's Johnny Bairstow's doziness, and it's Pat Cummins, the Australian captain, who could have said, "You know what? I think I, I think we're in we're against the spirit of the game here." I'm not having the two umpires being picked on. <laughs> Well, I mean, give them a breather. But what are they there for otherwise? I mean, the, 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 yeah, the they, whole point is that this is an imba- ambiguous situation. That's why there's so much controversy. And if the situation is ambiguous, it needs to be umpired. Yes. Mm. Absolutely. No, I'm sorry. I'm not having the two umpires at fault at this situation. Because everything gets reviewed anyway, so it goes upstairs and it comes back. It's out. So the letter it's of... not a review... But yeah, Bill, I, I the think... letter we're, we're agreeing. The letter of the law, it's out. Yeah, we're so all how the hell that. can the two umpires out in the field be at fault? <laughs> Jesus, we all we all give them a breather. <laughs> <laughs> God. Well, the third umpire doesn't know when they caught dead ball or caught over. So, I, yeah, you know, correct. it's not it's not the third umpire's decision. It was the two officiating umpires out in the middle, whether they thought it was dead ball or not, whether they thought it but was it, dead Brad, dead it, ball it can't That's be a – Brad, we've all played – it's not a dead ball when the keeper gets the ball in his hand and he whips the ball back to the stumps. It's not a dead ball. The ball is well, still live. We've only got Brad for a certain amount of time, and I think we're going to have to agree to disagree on this one because I don't think we're going to come, exactly to, right. come to come to what a I, conclusion. What I actually love about it is that there's so many different opinions about it. Yeah. And the good thing about it is that it's happened to you guys and there's people there that um, <laughs> see Johnny Bairstow out fault, and I see it differently from an Australian yeah. perspective. But I'm seeing it uh, fr- from afar. I'm not I'm not actually in the cordon. And I, as 
uh, Vaughan said, if I was out in the middle, I'd be accepting the wicket. But if it's pushed the boundaries of the spirit of cricket or it's not in the uh, the right vein of the game, the fielders out there, they're in the heat of battle. We've got 30 management staff sitting on the bench. So if the head coach thinks there's, that there's something wrong there, he can send the message out and say, no, Johnny, you're going back. So take it away from the players. Uh, if you're looking at it on an Australian perspective or any team that goes through these situations, that's what the management's there for, to control these uh, heat-of-the-moment situations so that we keep the game moving forward in a, in a positive spirit. The one thing I will say is that I, I, I do think Australia could have dampened uh, and, uh, and taken a bit of fuel off the fire after the game. Yeah. You know, the, the, if anything, it's all been added because they've said, absolutely, we were in our right. England have said we would never have done it. I, and, I, and, and I'm not too sure about that either because we don't know what England would have done in that situation because it didn't happen to them. You know, so, so let's be honest, it's very difficult for anyone to really make a judgment. But I do think by the way that the Aussies have kind of just gone, nah, we're in our right. Um, to not even just dampen it down slightly uh, has certainly created a hotbed for Headingley. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be hot. I, th- I think the, the, the whole issue here, we agree to disagree, but at the end of the day, when you've got something controversial like this, was a player taking advantage of a situation to better his team? Johnny Bairstow wasn't, and that's why uh, I think there's a lot more controversy to it than uh, a, a, a man um, Yeah, that's, that's where I sit on the situation. I tell you, Brad, no wonder you're on the board, mate. No wonder you're on the board now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know about that, mate. <laughs> so obviously, Brad, you were a great spin bowler in your day. Uh, another massive talking point from Lords was uh, Nathan Lyon, who's who's obviously pulled up lame and is now out of the series. How big a difference do you think that's going to make? Oh, it's going to make a huge difference. Nathan Lyon is the backbone of this Australian attack. There's no doubt about that. Um, if you look at uh, the last year and a half, he's bowled 30% of the overs. Pat Cummins is the next out 16%. So you've got that experience. But Murphy is a very good bowler. Um, he came into Indian conditions, adapted really well, changed things up with his uh, with his grip to suit those conditions. Uh, the big issue for me now going over to, uh, to to England is getting used to that Duke's ball. We, we, uh, we're exposed to it over here in Australia with the odd shield game here and there, and we've got balls to bowl in the nets. But it's completely different um, for, for me. Uh, the seems different. It seems a little bit slipperier than a, a kookaburra, harder to control. So can Murphy uh, control it and can he bowl tight like Nathan Lyon and bowl the overs like Nathan Lyon? And I think he can. So I don't think we're going to miss anything uh, anything there. And Nathan Lyon, that's, that is a big issue too. The Australian management sending him out like they did, uh, I thought was quite disgraceful. And then people saying, well, England bowlers shouldn't be bowling short to him. Well, hang on. He's gone out there. He's saying that he can handle it, um, and he's he's put in the uh, in the flyer. Now, if something happened to Nathan Lyon, which ruined his career or damaged it even more, workplace and healthy uh, uh, health, <laughs> work health and safety back here in Australia, the insurance claims would be uh, massive. And I, I can't believe that if you're going to replace a, a batsman for the concussion rule, because that's a batsman's. Um, uh, how can I put it? He hasn't read the ball after training for so long. He hasn't read the ball. It's his his misreading of the ball that's caused the injury. Whereas when it's a physical injury to a fast bowler or a spinner like uh, with Nathan Lyon, they can't control that. And you don't want a scenario where they're out there trying to help their team win because they know if they don't, then the other bowlers have to bowl more overs. I, I think we've got to look at it. There's a replacement player for everyone every injury, or there's no replacement players. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. What are we expecting from uh, Todd Murphy? What sort of kind of bowler is he, Brad? Oh, look, he's, he's very similar to Nathan Lyon in a sense. I've, I've only really seen him in England. He's only just come on the scenes over here in Victoria. But the one thing I really love about him, he works hard at his game. He asked questions. He went and did uh, a bit of work with Stephen O'Keefe before he went over to India. He's planned before he's gone to England. He's he's one of those. He's like an Ashwin, um, as such. He's making uh, he's making decisions or or preparing for those next opportunities that might be there. 
if he did, didn't play in England, he would have worked his guts off to make sure that he was ready for that one-off test match. And at the end of the test series, wherever Australia are going, he'd be working on the nets for those conditions as well. So he's probably going to be one of the most prepared uh, youngsters that, that come into the lineup, and that's why I think that he's going to do a wonderful job for Australia. Don't worry about the wickets. It's about keeping it tight. If he keeps it tight, then the wickets will come for him. He doesn't have to be or act like an eighth in line. And I think that's the problem with Australian spinners since Shane Warner's uh, left. We're expecting to find that big wicket-taking uh, option that bowls tight. You're never going to find that. Shane Warne was once in a lifetime. But I'll tell you what, Nathan Lyon uh, has come close and is probably up there with, with the greats of spinners that we've seen in, the, in uh, the history of the game. Right, Brad, I, uh, I don't know whether you've listened to the pod before, but we have a section uh, towards the end of our interview where Phil comes in with some either-or questions. <laughs> oh, yay. Let's go for it. I, thank you, Ben. Um, okay, here we go, mate. Aussie rules, which I found out you were, you were an umpire for a short time, at. Eh? Aussie rules or rugby? Aussie rules. Aussie rules. Oh, good love. Love that. Straight in. Uh, Registan Royals or Cal- Calcutta Knight Riders? <laughs> oh, that's a hard one. Um <laughs> Rajasthan Royals because they kick, uh, they they pick juniors to develop, and uh, that's better be- uh, benefit for Indian cricket. Kolkata Knight Riders um, because you're sort of in the Bollywood lights there. <laughs> yeah. So which one? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, Kolkata Knight Riders. It's going to give me more opportunity as I get older. <laughs> right. Okay then. Um, the bowling of Andy Flower in 03, which Gilly said was the ball of the tournament, or getting Flint off stumped in 07, World Cup, the wrong one. Um, Andy Flower. Andy Flower, ball of the century, love that. A ball of the tournament. I can, well, I can tell a story about that. How uh, did he do? Uh, well, basically, Darren Lehman, Ian Harvey and myself had to do the uh, planning for uh, Zimbabwe. And we were sitting there and they were talking about Andy Flower for about 30 minutes. And I said, look, this is getting boring. Just give me the ball and I'll get him out with a flipper. And Darren Lehman, I, I was only new to the team at this stage, and Darren Lehman's just gone, Hoggy, shut up. No more. No more input from you. And Vaughan knows uh, Lehman pretty well. So anyway, it came to that uh, first ball, the second over, and I'm out the top of the mark. And John Buchanan is in the back of my head going, just bowl, stock ball, first ball of an over. And I'm, I'm just feeling that I've got to bowl the flipper. And I thought, I've never listened to the old man on the family farm out home. Why should I listen to John Buchanan? Came in, got him off stump, and I'm down there celebrating. But I'm trying to hold my lips because I'm yelling out to uh, Darren Lehman, you'll listen to me now, won't you, boof, <laughs> with a few other choice words. <laughs> well, here we go then. Very good. Next one, uh, wrong and or flipper? Um. Flipper. Flipper, okay. And then, well, very, very uh, very apt for this conversation, Mancad or Carey Stumping? <laughs> Mancad. <laughs> Man- <laughs> Good lad. Well done, mate. <laughs> Brad, that's brilliant. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks for your time. Thank you so Cheers, much, Brad. boys. Cheers, mate. Good to see you, Vaughny. Good to see you, Cheers, Tuffy. Pal. Thanks, Ben. Great to have you on. Cheers, mate. We are joined again by the Chief Cricket Correspondent at the Telegraph, Nick Holt. Nick, you're um, you're up in Headingley already, aren't you? Um, with the schedule as it is, uh, have, you, have you seen any of your family recently? Uh, very briefly, wave goodbye this morning. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's par for the course in these sort of series. It's back-to-back games, but actually I'm quite glad that it's a back-to-back game because it means that uh, the narrative moves on again. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, and uh, you've obviously been to a few press conferences. There's also news uh, out of the camp about um, uh, about Oli Pope, I believe. Yes, Pope's out, not just out this test match, but out the rest of the series with a shoulder injury. Um, he's obviously had a history of those in the past. He's had two operations on his shoulder, so it wasn't a surprise that he wasn't playing here. But a surprise, actually, that he's actually not going to be fit for the rest of the series. Mm. England are going to name their team... Uh, 
on uh, Wednesday, so they haven't actually confirmed at this stage who will play, but it's pretty, it looks pretty certain it will be Dan Lawrence um, batting at three, which is high, high up in the order for him. Um, yeah. The only other option is whether they shift everyone else up, um, Joe Root bat three and um, Moeen Ali come in lower down the order. I mean, England have got two choices to make. It's whether they pick Dan Lawrence, who has batted well for Essex. He scored 150 in his last championship game. Or whether they actually decide that taking 20 wickets is more important. It seems at the moment they're leaning more towards uh, the extra bowler, uh, which would probably ease Moen Ali's path back into the side um, with Mark Wood uh, bringing that extra pace in if he comes in for, for Jimmy Anderson. Um and maybe they'll look at Robinson as well because of his workloads. Um, but yeah, those are the two choices. Lawrence batting at three, which he doesn't do for his county, or or picking the extra bowler because they're worried about taking 20 wickets, which in this series has been a challenge for them. Right, yeah. Um, and um, so no inkling about what might be happening with the bowling lineup because we were talking about um, the fact that the uh, the bowlers have got a lot of overs uh, and obviously a lot of short stuff bowled at Lords, so uh, might be uh, might be a little bit tired, and maybe there'll be a possibility of uh, rotating the squad. Be surprised if uh, Mark Wood doesn't play. I think they want that pace in the team now. Um, yeah. This pitch, uh, they peeled back the covers about ten minutes ago, and honestly, it was hard to work out which was the pitch for the Test match. It's so green; it's like uh, the rest of the square. Obviously, it will be cut again tomorrow. Um, but Headingley is a pitching up ground. It's not a banging in short ground. Um, so I, I, I'm not so sure whether the the, uh, the bouncer thing will be such a such a factor here. The one thing that they have said, though, the reason that it's become a bit of a bounce war is because the juke ball is going soft after 35 or 40 overs a game. And obviously, you know, if this but if that's what's going to happen with this current batch, then um, then then yeah, that that suggests that it, it will play a bit more of a part than it normally would on a ground where it seems and swing particularly if it's uh, cloudy yeah now there's some chat about the balls last year wasn't there and there was a there was a theory that there was a bad batch and it might have been because of covid or something like that uh clearly that's carried over to this season uh yeah i did a story actually interview with dilip judoja who owns um who owns his juke ball uh company and he blamed uh covid and the, the cows not being fed properly during covid um yeah. uh in scotland so uh where he gets the leather from uh and this year, last year, they were falling apart very quickly. And I don't know, you remember, there were multiple yeah, ball, yeah, ball yeah. changes. This year, they seem to just be going softer. There are ball, more ball changes, but not as many as there were last year. So they're just losing that hardness, um, yeah. which obviously doesn't help Jimmy Anderson, um, who uh, a few weeks ago was the world's number one bowler. And now he's he's averaging 73 and probably not going to play here on the pitch. It looks like it, as if it would be suit, suit him down to the ground. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what's what's the general mood with the England camp? Have they calmed down from Lords, or are they using some of the perceived, perhaps, perhaps perceived, perhaps not perceived uh, injustices to fire them up? Oh, I think they're using it to fire themselves up. I think that it's also a useful way of papering over the cracks publicly. That actually, they, yeah. you know, that there, there are some poor passages of play in both test matches, and that's the reason why they're two 0 down. Uh, they chose Joe Root today for the press conferences, and obviously, you know, Joe uh, is Mister uh, Diplomatic. He negotiates a press conference very easily and very well, and without actually saying anything that's going to be controversial. Um, so they've they've tried to back away from it, but obviously, he did point out that it's firing up Johnny, uh, his old mate, yeah. who's got that stare uh, look in his yeah. eye this week playing on his home ground as well uh so yeah they just keep reiterating they wouldn't have done the same thing yeah uh, an angry birthday is a dangerous birthday well we've seen that before normally he's angry with michael vaughan because he's normally uh yeah. criticized him in the telegraph or on or on the or on the bbc and uh that's fired up johnny i think sometimes he's done it deliberately particularly with him with broad as well but um but yeah they're broad and bear so two narky cricketers who were who were up for the fight this week but it takes more than that against this attack i mean this, <laughs> yeah. this is a top class australian team and they will be obviously handicapped by losing line. Uh, the fact they put Todd Murphy up today, he's speaking right now to the press, uh, suggests yeah. that he's going to come in and, and he took uh, quite a few wickets in his debut in India. So useful, uh, a useful sort of uh, replacement. But England, you know, they target the spinners. He's going to have to, he's going to have to be strong this week and the boundaries here are not that big. Yeah, yeah. And uh, obviously uh, Ben Stokes has got his eye in. 
Yeah, Stokes has got his eye in. I, 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 I don't know whether he'd, he wouldn't have played that innings if it hadn't been for that incident. I think that that yeah. that, that completely fired him into form. I mean, and that's that's great for England. The two big players have got hundreds after the first two tests, Root and Stokes, um, and that that that's that doesn't normally happen when England are two 0 down in Ashes series. I just asked Joe actually about that and and said, you know, <laughs> you've been two 0 down in Ashes series before. Um, does it feel different this time? And he he. he he said, yeah, absolutely, because we've not been on the back end of hidings this time. Yeah. Um, and in the past, when they've always said, oh, we're going to come back, we can do it, it's always rang really hollow. But uh, And even though you, you can't really see them winning three games, you do sense that they have got a chance of, of getting something back this week. Yeah, no, excellent. Let's hope so anyway. Nick, cheers. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you. Cheers. So we've got to, we've got to talk about the third test. Uh, and who might be in the England team. And I think we have to talk about Jimmy Anderson, don't we? Uh, I mean, I'd step in front of a bullet for that guy, but uh, I did think he he looked a bit below par. Uh, He got two for 117 uh, in what looked like quite helpful conditions. He was England's most economical bowler in the first innings, but the least economical bowler in the second innings. Um, And there was one over towards the end where he got sort of slapped around a bit. And uh, I don't know, are are we witnessing the end of an era, Mike? Well, yeah, because he's he's 40, so he's not going to play that much longer. Um, I don't think he'll play at Headingley. I think both teams will rotate the bowling uh, attacks, I think, to bowl on these wickets week in, week out, particularly with the short stuff. And that's what I look at with England. They're going to go short to Australia, so surely Mark Wood has to play. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to bowl short, you need Tong and Mark Wood. Um, I, I don't know how Ollie Robinson is. You know, I don't know how he's going to show up. You've only got three days in between test matches, so it's not easy. And it might be that you see a couple of changes. Uh, if everyone's fit, I would just go Mark Wood for Jimmy. Uh, see where Jimmy's at the week after or the week after that. Uh, England have to win at Leeds, you know, obviously. They, to, to win the Ashes, they have to win the last three. They can't think about winning the last three. They've just got to win one, win the next one. And I think they need a little bit more pace. So I think Mark Wood for Jimmy Anderson. I, I, I'm not too sure about the spin, uh, Headley is a pitch that's different to when I used to play I think there is a little bit of tweak there now um, but I'm not too sure I'd play Moen even if he is fit I, I think I'd go with all the seamers because Ben clearly can't bowl 20 odd overs a day so they need that extra backup in the seam if they're going to do this uh, aggressive short pitch uh, bowling uh, method uh, so I'd go just uh, Mark Wood for Jimmy Anderson this way. that's if Wood's fit he hasn't played for months and months so it's got to be a risk to play him uh, but if he is in any way, shape or form ready to play, he must play. I, I personally wouldn't play Moen Ali if, if if the pitch looks like it's just a normal head and the wicket because Joe Root's off spin can be used and England looked to me like they've got a method of potentially upsetting the Aussies with the short stuff. And I don't think the Aussies will be too fearful of facing Moen Ali's off spin, but you know, played any cricket and he's obviously got that dodgy finger. Uh, so I would go all the seam again at Headingley. Yeah. Yeah, I was impressed with Josh Tung. I'm impressed with Josh Tung. I think he did a good job. Yeah, he's good. And he's obviously got an engine on him as well, which will be useful. Um, yeah. A stat for you. After two tests, Australia have faced 654 more balls than England and only scored 45 yeah. more runs. So, I mean, obviously, that's, what's that? 100 and, 110 more overs the England bowlers have bowled. Yeah, which which puts it in the legs. I mean, the, that's the one the one bad thing to Baz Ball is that you're out there bowling quite a lot. You know yeah. what I mean? And it goes it goes into the uh, the bowler's legs and gets them tired out again. But uh, it was a phenomenal, fun, another phenomenal Test yeah. matches. It, it, crikey, if we get Test match cricket like that, it is going to be it's just going to be sensational. Um, another three more to come, please. For me, going to be wicked. Can't wait. Can't wait for Henley. Very rare, you know. I don't think I've ever been so excited to be 2-0 down. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's all from us today. Big thanks to Brad Hogg for joining us and to Mike and Phil too. If you're new to the podcast, Mike, Phil and I will be here every Wednesday throughout the summer. Previous episodes from this season with the likes of Justin Langer, Adam Gelchrist and England legend Jeffrey Boycott are all available online right now. If you have any feedback, questions or comments, the address is cricketclub at telegraph.co.uk. Please drop us a line. We'll be back with you next week following the Headingley Test up in Leeds. So until then, goodbye. <laughs>